because it's not just about the birth. It's no. them making other healthy choices, perhaps because of the birth and where the collaborative practice can incorporate the exercise physiologist, the nutritionist for healthy living, all aspects of their life, not just in, in, in the birth. Welcome back to the Midwifery Wisdom Podcast. This week, Augustine is joined by guest Dr. Daryl Martin, a recently retired OB with an incredibly refreshing perspective on obstetrics. Daryl joins us to share his journey from residency to retirement and how along the way, he became an advocate for collaboration between OBs and CNMs. He shares some of his personal experiences with fighting for birthing mama's rights and midwives' rights in hospitals and is a true champion for midwifery in an unexpected place. He also shares a bit about his book, In Good Hands, that has recently been published. Without further ado, let's jump into this conversation about reframing the model of obstetrics. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to the Midwifery Wisdom Podcast. It's such an honor to have you on the show. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I've done one or two podcasts at this point, and the book is finally being sent out for review, I think yesterday uh, or early next week. It'll be the, the galley copy. Yeah, so we're How excited. exciting. Well, let's start with introductions. Tell us who you are, where you are, and what you do. And obviously, we know you just wrote a book, so we're going to hear about that too. But start with your bio and don't hold anything back. Okay. Well, uh, my name is Daryl Martin. I'm a physician who's retired. I retired two years ago. I retired from obstetrics at 60, so about 15 years prior to that time, principally because in my younger years, I was an avid marathon runner. And back then, you put shoe glue on your tennis shoes. You didn't buy new tennis shoes. And so I ended up with hip and knee replacements that I needed for about 15 years that struggled through getting around the hospital. I grew up in a small town in western Pennsylvania and went to college there and medical school in West Virginia. Kept moving south. My chairman at West Virginia had been the chairman at Vanderbilt and I was looking either at Vanderbilt or Duke and uh, I felt like at Duke my as, as I joke my sphincter would have been way too tight very intense kind of organization the interview yes, indeed. the interview was we will make you a chairman one day and you will work hard to get to that point and I said at Vanderbilt it was much more uh, uh, at least my interview was much more relaxed. It's a little bit of it is in the book. And it was the place where I met Sandy. And that was where the journey that led to the book uh, pretty much evolved. It was a long journey from residency from 1973 to 1977 to part-time faculty at Vanderbilt and working with nurse midwives to attempting private practice. Uh, there and being stopped by the establishment. And then that, I wrote the book principally as I was doing, you know, I, I kind of, I try to keep things with patients light too, you know, try to make them go away. I figure that if you have a gynecological visit and you go out laughing or smiling, it's a good day for you because you connected with, with that patient. So I, I've always had that, you know, desire to uh, connect and be open uh, you know, it's much more than just as back then we would say breast pelvic and pack. You know, it, it was far more than that. And the the story tells the journey of how and why in a, a still an established, very established town, very conservative town. And to a degree, not so much a conservative residency, but I think the the things that I was exposed to caused me to pause and think of how to do obstetrics and gynecology in a, in my opinion now, you know, a better way. 
I'm not sure if it's totally the right way, but I think a better way than we we were taught. And can you summarize that? Like, what are the better points that you've learned? Well, I learned much more about caring and putting the client, this nurse midwives who taught me, you know, we can use terms interchangeably for how we view a person that you see. You know, I kind of looked at it, how you treat them matters more than what you say, but at the same time, a client, you're coming in for a wellness visit. You know, you're providing a service. Now, if they have a problem, that may push them over into part of their visit is a patient visit. They have a problem that you're trying to correct, uh, but primarily you're providing a service. So to consider what we do is, is serving, you know, in, in any good service industry, I mean, people are taught to provide good service. And the part of that in medicine is, you know, grow up in an atmosphere to a degree of, I, without, you know, the doctors who may pat the person on the back and say, don't worry, I'll take care of everything. You don't need to know anything. You know, that sets yourself up for failure. I always felt like that if the person I was relating and taking care of, that we could get in, in quote, the bucket together, that things may not always turn out perfect. But if you take ownership of everything, you're, you're putting yourself up on a pretty big pedestal and eventually you're going to come off that pedestal. So engaging the person, uh, uh, their partner as a couple with the problems or questions, the more they know, to me, the easier it is. Because the more they know, they know that life's not perfect, that things aren't going to go always 100%. And it isn't, doesn't necessarily have to be, in quote, somebody's fault that things have happened. So, you know, I learned that by, I think, one of our attendings attendings uh dr bohm was very instrumental he, he taught me so much from the technical aspects whether that's you know he trained with ed hahn at yale on the initial field monitoring so we had a very very intense and very confident ability at that point to understand fetal monitoring in fact those were the first fetal monitors i ever dealt with at vanderbilt and his family had bought them for the uh, hospital. Um, wow. Uh, and so that was a big step. But what he did was he had a group of nurses, nurse practitioners who worked with him in an allied health role. A lot of it they were doing in Italy was like research for him. And that was an important aspect of what you would do as an attending. But he also introduced me to... That was how I met Susie Sizemore, one of the nurse midwives that I, I, I worked with. She initially, after her nursing uh, career uh, was finished, after she graduated from Hopkins, she was down there working for him, with him, before she went on to midwifery school. And then uh -huh. he, he introduced us, I think, as I wrote the book, I wrote the book because patients asked me what I was going to do. You know what my, you know, we see rock concerts, they retire, and then they come back when they when I choke you, they're bored or they need money. Well, you can't do that as a physician. So, uh, no. easily. so <laughs> I told them what they asked me, what I was going to do. And, and I saw these people I'd seen for 30 and 40 years. And, and I said, well, I'm going to write a book. And that's how it evolved. And, and, and it became that's a great. narrative from the day I was born and what a little I knew that my mother told me until I basically retired. But he had me one grand rounds. He brought in and you may or may not be familiar with her, Ina Mae Gaskin, who started the the farm in Somerton. And I sat there and listened, you know, to birthing out in the fields. And a lot of the, obviously, the residents in the room were laughing, making jokes. But it, she, I said, gosh, if that works, why why not? You know, and, and she made a real big impression on me for alternative medicine in a traditional residency. So he really introduced me to her. See, our residency program was divided up into three hospitals. We had Vanderbilt, which is again, just like a Duke would be sphincters tight, you know, had to be on your best <laughs> behavior. You know, that's where yeah. you got quizzed. Now, the impression was when we got quizzed, Susie 
was was there with him. Invariably, if one of the residents didn't know the answer, she did. So uh -huh. and, and she did in a humble, non cocky way that just made an impression. She was also when I came to Vanderbilt, I came as a fourth year medical student and she was working in labor and delivery along with Frank and she befriended me and I was single and went to her home with her husband and two kids at dinner. He did some nighttime gigs as a folk singer and went to those. We played tennis and um, tennis and basketball together. And so I connected with her on a much more personal level as someone I respected in terms of her kindness, but her ability, her sharpness, and not one who would overly show it. And, and she just was very quiet, but very strong, very strong. I mean, she was the leader of our group when it came to all that happened in Nashville. And then, so we had Vanderbilt, then we had Baptist, which I don't want to say the good, the bad, the ugly. That was where all the private positions were. So you saw the things that you didn't want to do with forceps. You saw the use of scopolamine and amnesiacs, where as a resident, you're not even hardly thinking about it. It's like, oh, I get to go do the delivery for them because there's no family in the room and she doesn't know what's going on. But uh, that's the way it was in, in the in the 70s. And, you know, that started back in the 20s with scopolamine and inductions and all the things that are so wrong. And then the third part was National General. And that was where, that was my love. National General was a city hospital, took all comers, and they started a maternal infant care project there. And so that brought in the nurse midwives who finally worked alongside of us. And so we would see the difference. We would see the better outcomes the better, the more connection, you know, as a resident in general, you want to learn all the problems, right? You want to be able to deal with the catastrophes. You know, you got to, you know, see how many hyper forceps you could put on a breach, hold it in and put the forceps on to, to learn, you know, in quote, and the lack of connection, because you, you would never really connect with a person who was delivering then it was just like a job. And then you see, you contrast that with the, the nurse midwives observing that group and the connection and how, how they were out of the hospital quicker, less problems, better connection. And so that all those things made an impression. And probably more satisfied with their births. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when all the years that I worked with nurse midwives, I said, you know, you get all the fun deliveries. I get all the ones. Sometimes families could care less, just get the baby out. When when we worked, and that jump skips to 1983, 84 in Atlanta and all the, I'm skipping for right now what happened in Nashville and how I got to Atlanta. But when I started there, it was still the desire to have nurse midwives. And, you know, back then, the way that nurse midwives would be blocked would be two principal ways, uh, in my opinion. One, they'll get the doctor. You know, they'll get the doctor. They need a doctor to deliver in a hospital. They need someone as their, in quote, backup. So if, if the, the powers to be can stop him, scare him off, then there is no ability for the, the nurse midwife or midwife to work in the hospital. The second way they do it is with policies and procedures. You know, when we moved from one hospital to the next, I mean, when I did start the private practice, it was in Hendersonville, Tennessee. It was a brand new hospital after I'd been in the area for a couple of years. And myself and a resident that I finished with, we were really the only providers to degree. So I was able, without being encumbered by established physicians, you know, we were able, that was in 1979, to attain the first exemption in the state for children at birth. So it was the wow. first hospital to do that. And we, we were easily able to get any, you know, and quote, use any rooms we wanted as birthing rooms and non-intervention because there were no other physicians who would say, I don't want to do that. So you can't do it. You know, that, that mm -hmm. might 
mess up the the apple cart for me if I don't do it and patients come to you or then I'm going to have less business and I'm going to lose money. So, you know, that's such an interesting point. I, I think midwives are just sort of figuring this out, birth workers in general. But what you're saying goes right in line with what I've been saying for a lot of years, which is that hospital based care is kind of the lowest common denominator of the sum of the providers in that space. Wouldn't you agree? Where like, they so don't meet. They don't meet in the middle. They always meet to the most okay. conservative. Yeah. Because well, you know, and, and so, and there's two reasons. I mean, we even had, when we were battling, and we got blocked in Tennessee. I sat, and still, it's, it's unbelievable, even in 1979, 1980, that a physician would say this. He said in a meeting, we can't have midwives delivering babies in private it's okay if they take care of the indigent that's what he said but they they don't want to take care we don't we don't want them to take care of the privates because they're starving obstetricians in nashville so that set it up for all the ftc and all the litigation that we had because he said something you know admittedly to me that pretty dumb and then i was in a meeting where i was castigated for doing the deliveries and actually not breaking the bed. I, I, I was forced to do, and it's in the prologue. When you read it, hopefully you'll read the book and the prologue tells the story of the delivery that I had to do for Susie because the hospital wouldn't let her do it. And the eyes of Texas were on us. You know, they were like waiting for any screw ups to happen. And so, you know, if she'd have touched them, that I'd have been out, she'd have been out, that they were looking for, for something. It was a lot in that sense, it was pressure. But when you see the book uh, and the, the the title, In Good Hands, is the picture that was in the Nashville papers where I did a birth for Susie. And you see four sets of hands in the picture, the baby's head coming out, Jessica. Now, now I know it's Jessica. And you see John and Susie Logan's hands and my hands all in the picture together around the baby delivering the baby. So I go to this meeting and they're just freaking out. And the, the one doctor said, he said, Daryl, I, I just don't understand why these midwives, these women or these girls, I think, you know, he was using pejorative terms. He said, why they would question physicians. And I hmm. said, I started laughing with me, why would they question physicians? And he goes, well, that's like questioning motherhood, apple pie, and Chevrolet. And that, Somehow he got that backwards, of course, because of midwives course. predate physicians. <laughs> yes. So it, it was like, it was an era of like, and all the threats bore fruit. Now he threatened because it was interesting. That was when we had to move from Hendersonville, which the story will tell, to attempt to do it at Southern Hills, which were another, was another hospital corporation of America hospital, private hospital. So all the policies and procedures at the one, Hendersonville, were ones that I had helped develop, so they were very liberal. And so this new hospital, they just put all those policy procedures in. So it was right in the heart of Nashville. They said, well, we're going to fix that. We're going to shut down the birthing room. We're going to make women have preps. We're going to make women have enemas. We're going to make them all have IVs. So that's the other way that they can intervene to block midwifery care. Procedures, policies yeah. and procedures, you know. That's hard to fight that. It's hard to fight that if they if they have, you know. The, it's hard you know, to open up the books and rewrite the policy once they've been written and established. Yeah, well, if, it wouldn't be hard if they had the numbers. I mean, if they had, they could vote it out. They they could vote out. They could change them. And the hospital really, quite frankly, only cares about money and keeping the physicians right. happy. But once there's a number of, of established, long-term, older physicians, you can't vote it out. That's no. the idea. And and then you need, you need the new physicians to change the, the protocol. Well, and, and and if there's not enough of them, you get you get shut down. And the problem for them was that that was one of those eras, again, where there was a, in quote, malpractice crisis. So it was hard to get malpractice insurance. So the physicians started their own malpractice carrier in Tennessee, state volunteer mutual insurance company. And one of the fellows that was on the board as all this was evolving was an OBGYN. 
very old establishment kind of person in Nashville. And he just overtly said in front of people that he was going to get my malpractice, that he was going to get rid of me and, and, and get rid of these midwives and set them back 20 years. Well, they did take my malpractice insurance. That was how I got booted out of Nashville. In October of that year, they sent me a letter said that uh, working with nurse midwives is risks of undue proportion and you no longer will have malpractice. Insurance. Now, the, the, the caveat too was that when we talked to Susie and Vicki about the practice, right, of having a practice with them. The first attempt was in the fall was with Vanderbilt. That would okay. be able, that would be a logical place to do it because you're protected. There's a certain that umbrella of protection in, a, in an academic setting. And sure. where Dr. Burnett was from, from Hopkins, they had a nurse midwifery school. Our maternal fetal person, Frank Bone, was all for it. Yep. Well, we had just started the relationship with Baptist as the private hospital and the private doctors. Some of this is, in fact, channel kind of information that was yeah. sort of hard to get at. Uh, they said, it's, it's us or them. You know, do you, how badly do you want nurse midwives or do you want the residents over here at Baptist? Wow. Of course, they opted for the residents at, at Baptist. So that didn't bear fruit. You know, they doing multiple proposals with Vandy. I was involved peripherally because I was a part-time faculty and was going to support them. We even were going to do it at the general, you know, the indigent place. But again, someone was on the board who was an influential gynecologist who said, you start messing with that and we're going to take the whole program away from you. So then the goal was that Susie and Vicky, who I knew real well, one of the other fellows that I was working with, Ron Rice, also had been at Vanderbilt, also was part-time faculty. So we were together in a practice at Hendersonville, new hospital, our roles. And so we attempted to do it there, and it was looking good until the word got out that it was happening. And, and here's the irony. We... Our privileges for them went through the OB department, no problem. Of course, we were the OB department, right? It went through the anesthesia department, no problem. Pediatrics blocked it. Now, it, it, why would, logically, why would you think that pediatrics would block nurse midwives when primarily, where does their referral source come from? A lot from obstetricians saying to a, a new mother, these are good pediatricians, right? but they would not review their protocol. They said dumb things like, if you can find someone to take care of all our Medicaid babies, then you could have a gear. And we said, you know, they're not just gonna have Medicaid babies. Uh, oh no, no. And then they said, one of them was quoted as just saying, Dara, uh, I don't understand. You'd be better off having a taxi driver deliver the baby instead of a midwife. You know, it's dumb stuff. So they blocked it. And no condescending, so patronizing, so patriarchal. Oh, God. Yeah. life yeah. has changed so much. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I would like to think yes, but not in all cases. I mean, there still aren't any nurse midwives practicing in, in Nashville other than at Vanderbilt. I mean, and, there's birth centers. Uh, but, and, um, in birth, and in birth centers, yeah. But but you're right. I mean, there there has been a fundamental societal change. Um, away from this incredibly patronizing patriarchy behavior that you're describing yeah. from these male physicians, including racist behavior. Um, there's been a fairly fundamental change societally, but we still do not have integrated care. We still do not have midwives working arm in arm with physicians most of the country. This episode is brought to you by Laudor Bookkeeping, a virtual bookkeeping firm supporting midwives and doulas. We understand that what you love to do is serve mamas. So while we focus on managing your books, you can focus on client care. By keeping your books clean and tidy, we can help you make confident money moves, pay yourself a consistent salary, proactively save for taxes, and plan for growth. Learn more about working with us by clicking the link in the show notes. Why do you think there's such the animosity? 
is it really just a money game? Is it really just the numbers game? Well, yeah, I, I think that money is involved. Clearly, money is involved. Uh, control is involved. I think that when I, and I, over the years, I've interviewed quite a few physicians. You know, our practice evolved from 1984 when I finally landed in Atlanta in a hospital that only had five other OBGYNs all over 55, and I was 35, who pretty much uh -huh. let me do whatever I wanted to, right? So uh -huh. I was in an environment where they didn't they didn't care. And so we we grew a practice. We had kind of two-part midwifery practice. One was the private, and one we ultimately took over for Emory to take care of indigents. So at our peak, we were doing 150 to 175 deliveries a month with the first clients as well. Between the, yeah, mm -hmm. between the two practices. And with 12, mm -hmm. 10 to 12 nurse midwives, three nurse practitioners, and four to six physicians. So, but we were unencumbered by any rules. They were happy. The hospital was happy to have us, right? And there weren't any physicians to, to block us. Now, what I was getting ready to say was, in, in terms of today, through those years, I probably interviewed 10 to 20 physicians to join the practice because at a peak, we had 12, 12 physicians. Right. I can honestly say it. there was not a single one of them that came because they wanted to work with nurse midwives. Huh. You know, my passion was not their passion. And when I when you dove into it, the, a lot of them came from outstanding residency programs where they were very well trained. And there, some of them did have midwifery services there. And they saw them as an annoyance to them. They were there doing all this high tech stuff. And then a, a midwife might have a problem come over in the midst of them being, in quote, busy. And so they never really collaboratively work with them. You know, I, I, I don't think that the way residencies are set up, they allow for the collaborative practice. So I don't know if you're going to. There's involve... definitely one in, in Philadelphia. I know for a fact that the. I'm not sure if it's the UPenn or the Jefferson program, but the midwives actually are who train the residents in that program. So it's it's definitely come along in a few places. Yeah, well, um, but the we did, hire a, we did hire a, a physician from the UPenn, and she she was all in. And, and you are correct. Now that their their practice got inundated because Hahnemann shut down, and they yeah. they immediately took another large segment of patients. So they were knee deep in alligators with the volume that they were doing. But Correct. I think it was her general person who she was, that she understood the value and didn't see them as an annoyance. And some of the ones I interviewed said, well, yeah, you know, I can work with them. It wasn't like, oh, I'm so excited about doing it. So I think you got to grow so the up. Reason, the reason that we don't have that excitement is, the I think it's the general difference in the model. So like the goal or the focus of the midwifery model of care is to actually move things back and keep them normal. Exactly. And the goal of obstetrical care is oftentimes to use the tools they know how to use and make it as fast as possible instead of as physiologic as possible. Would you say that's the difference? Oh, a hundred percent. And that started in the early 1900s, you know, Correct. when physicians became, I mean, quote, a professional organization, which led to licensure, led to their rules and, and control. And they needed birth to train medical students slash residents when there was yeah. some organizational structure. And how did they do that? They had to create a model where it was a pathological condition, not a natural one, which moved midwives out and moved, yeah. moved physicians in. That's why our country is so different than a, a lot of other industrialized countries where midwives right. do the midwives should be doing the the vast. Well, I believe always a couple has a choice, you know. Sure. But, but given but given even... given appropriate education, they're going to take a choice. You know, and I and I would often tell patients, you know, they would ask me, well, if I use the midwife, why pay less? I said, 
no, you're getting actually two people. You should pay more. If anything, we're, we're giving you a deal. And, and at the beginning, I would change if, how I would do it today. Back then, I was battling mothers, mother-in-laws, grandmothers, families, you know, about, in quote, the safety of midwives because they were told stories as subtle and obvious ones. So I would give couples the choice. Now, today, I would not do that. I would just work collaboratively and say, you know, and I would tell, they would ask me, well, why? And I said, well, you know, on my best day, I'm a b way below average midwife doing your delivery <laughs> on my best day, on my best day. I said, I've mimicked things. I've delivered babies on balls and bounce, and I've done it, done it all, but I'm spent a lot of time in the room in active labor and in, in the second stage, but never, never to the level because I have too many other things I'm doing. You know, if they're responsible for eight to 12 deliveries a month, then what I'm responsible for and everything else, I just can't possibly do it. Even if I was good enough, I couldn't possibly. The scope is different. It's a different, it's yes. a different scope. Yeah. Yep. So, Absolutely. Yep. So yeah. no, I would do it. And I would do it in a birth center, you know, and there are some in Florida that I've been reading that where they've gotten privileges to do their, their sections too. And yep. Advanced have become legal in Florida this March. There's yes. none of them are open yet, but the, the theory, there's a lot of concern around this. Actually, the theory is that they're just going to be cesarean centers. And yeah, I mean, actually... it, it all, you know, it all depends on the person, right? You know, you could do it. Uh, I mean, I would say that if I had the birth center and I was next door to the same hospital I was using and I could transport them over for those, you know, our section rates were way under 10%. And what in Atlanta now they're plus 35%. And the, and the uh, statistics, the weight change of babies has not changed in the last 40 years significantly. So it has nothing to do with bigger babies, which no. they, they would argue it's, it's all about inducing in the morning and sectioning before the sun goes up. Yep. And, and that's still happening. And yep. that's still happening. And so how that changes your, your, your the, it has to be the physician group, the model for how they're trained is just going to. Yeah. Access, access and education is one important piece and really reframing the model in obstetrics to one that supports physiologic birth instead of efficiency. And then I think the third piece that's going to precipitate the change that I think we're both looking for is the physician shortage. We're headed towards such a crisis that I think they're going to have no choice but to have to integrate midwifery care. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And I, you know, have friends, one of whom was the past president now this month of the PAs and allied health professionals in dermatology. And all they meet annually or multiple times during the year with all the presidents of all the allied health professionals and everybody is saying that and seeing that you, you know the cost of producing physicians is incredible i just you know the, the amount of money that it takes to get through medical school and that it's it's just not sustainable uh, and also the the schools are not admitting more people no no, they're not. And I'm not saying there's any right or wrong. This is the fact that as we're producing not only more women as obstetrician gynecologists, but also men who, quite frankly, aren't are willing to work like we were willing to work. Be careful I say that, you know, every other night, every third, they, they're not interested in that. So just the dynamics of they want to work less hours. They want to become an obstetrician for X number of years and then become a gynecologist because they want their own family, right? They want to have their own children. They want to be home with their own children. So they don't want to do obstetrics as long. Yes. I mean, and also obstetric malpractice is now so exorbitant that it's, it could be questioned that they're even making money between loan repayment and malpractice insurance. You know, it's not a lucrative profession any longer. No, no, it's, you know, we were fortunate, at least in Georgia, that we had a group of several hundred obstetricians who negotiated for malpractice rates and had 
meetings annually or semi-annually for improvement of quality of care to try to mitigate uh, malpractice cases. But I bet if you're connected to the patient, there's there or the couple, and I'm going to use all those words interchangeably, uh, interchangeably, you have less suits. I mean, yeah, you, you know, you're still going to have some bad results. I mean, that that's probably unavoidable. There's going to be bad outcomes. But if you're connected to that couple, there's much less likely that you're going to have a fear of a of a, of a suit. Um, Definitely. When you're a human to them. Yes. Yes. How you should be. Yeah, just natural, you know. You're, you know, to just be caring and serving is, is the whole purpose. So I have a friend who um, she's an obstetrician, gynecologist, and worked with myself for years she stopped to raise her two children and uh, as she's getting back into it now probably she's closer to 50 she was doing a little bit of laborious work to keep her hands in it now she's kind of gone back into private practice and i've been talking helping counsel her because she's going to start from doing what she's doing is just gynecology to now doing births but she's only going to do them with nurse midwives I, well, that's the way to go, Cynthia. And uh, and so she wants my help in counseling. I think I gather your opinion. And she has, she wants to know my opinion on the salary structure and how to employ. I said, well, first of all, I think it should be profit sharing. If you if you don't if you don't have you haven't done any deliveries, it's pretty obvious for you to be able to tell what is going to change your overhead. You don't want to constantly be changing the midwives. You want to have them. Yeah. be a peer a partner with you and that's, that's right that, that was part of back in 1980 that that blew in the face of the physicians we were technically going to be the employee of Susie and vicky we we were going to be their consultants and they would reimburse us an appropriate fee as their consultants but they would run their own business they would pay their own employees it would do their births and people would say, well, aren't you worried? I said, well, I still have essential control to the degree that if they're doing something medically inappropriate, I don't have to work with them any longer. So money doesn't always mean necessarily control. But so I, I'm going to encourage you. But autonomy to... does actually. Yeah. Autonomy yeah. for both is actually really brilliant. I, I love that. Yes. Yeah. You, you yeah, you got to be somebody that you feel comfortable with both ways and yeah. you're you're going to sit at the table and discuss your monthly medical issues and your monthly business issues um, as peers yeah mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely it's, it's that's the only way to travel so i'm going to encourage you to do it as more of a profit sharing you love know, that yeah I, well so now are you are you currently consulting for other are you open to to consulting for more Sure. I'm open to it. I just see what doors open. You know, right now it's finishing the book. Yeah. I'm, I, my wife gets a little bit worried that I'll, I'll be bored. What am I going to do? You know, I'm going to run out of riding my Peloton bike, going on runs and uh, doing working out, doing some reading and, and, and things. My devotional. Yeah. If, if the door opens for some, you know, we were offered to do a movie on this. I was called multiple times in the early 80s and i just turned it down because i wanted to hide i i was i had enough i had positive press from new york times wall street journal 60 minutes but from the physician community no so such fun. yeah th this is one real fu funny story so as i did this journey to try to find where i would end up in atlanta I was in a couple of places in South Carolina because no one would hire me. And I was taken advantage of, and a little bit of it's in the story. So I went to this hospital and the guy I went to work with wasn't, he had a little bit of a reputation of not showing up for the indigent birth. You know, they had a hard time finding him. So he wasn't like the the pick of the litter necessarily for the hospital. So for like I, the Medicaid, is that what you mean? Yeah, well, yes. Yeah, you, know, you know, back then it was a, a beeper and he would not answer his beeper. There were no phones back then, remember? Uh, 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 
So I had to go before the board of the hospital, the physician, the executive committee, and the hospital people to kind of, they wanted to feel me out. So um, I'm sitting there and they're asking the very nice questions. Then finally one has to, the nerve to ask me the big question. He said, well, Dr. Martin, I understand that you're being sued. And, and, and I, and I kind of got a little quizzical look on my face. I said, no. Well, yeah, I said, no, actually, you have that mistake, and I'm actually the plaintiff in the suit. I'm not the defendant. And so what's that mean? Well, hospitals were denying me privileges, so now I'm suing them because they denied my privileges, and they're, they're interviewing me for privileges, and their faces all turned gray and ashen. And I said, uh, 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 okay, uh, you'll have your privileges tomorrow. <laughs> it, it, it was kind of It was kind of funny. You know, they were going down a road that they didn't know what road they were going down. Um, That's so fascinating. So, Did you win your case? Yeah, we, uh, the, the Federal Trade Commission ruled that in, was 81, 83, that this, the Volunteer Mutual Insurance Company had to open their books and had to have anything reviewed by the FTC where they deny privileges to a physician working with nurse midwives or allied health professionals and wow that stopped according to i'm sure you know who kitty erst is definitely uh, yeah and i've had i've had dinner with her and ruth lubbock uh they felt like that litigation stopped a lot of the same things were happening across the united states and then we also had a sherman antitrust lawsuit it was finally settled in 1993, which clearly held back midwifery from Nashville. I mean, Nashville was where it all happened. So nothing. The irony was that after that was all over, now Nashville has one of the better midwifery programs in the country. One of the best at Vanderbilt. Exactly. I yeah. have friends graduating from it that are extraordinarily happy with it. Yeah, I've had the pleasure of going back the last couple of years and, and lecturing to the graduating class along with Erwin Venick, who was the attorney, and he's done it for quite a few years. He, he's done it for quite a few years there. But that, and then they bought the birth center. I mean, it was all the stuff we wanted to do in 1980, and now they're doing it. You know, they could have been- Just before your time. Yeah. Yes, I was before my time, but it would be fun. I, I've been joined with Cynthia trying. First, I wanted to make sure of her passion, you know, that she was doing it for the right reason, not just to make a little bit more money, I'm going to throw obstetrics into the mix and I can generate some more income. And I said, if you're, if you're going to work with midwives, you need to do it the right way. You need to do it the right way. They're going to pick that up really quick. If, if you're using it and abusing them, and then you're just going to run through a bunch of people and you're not going to be happy and staff, no one's going to do it. You got to do it the right way. So yeah, that's fun. That would be fun doing that. Um, it's amazing. We'll, see. well, we'll see. have you have you ever um, gotten to uh, meet and connect with Ginger Breedlove? No, no, I, I kept. I, I would love to connect you with Ginger Breedlove. She owns a consulting company called Grow Midwives. Is she the Midwest? She's trying to connect uh, nurse midwives with physicians and and to grow practice of midwives around the country. Now there was a consultant. The other person that was the midwife with me was Vicki Henderson Burslam. She was the other part of the team. She's a professor at Frontier Nursing right now. Mm -hmm. She's very mm -hmm. active in, she referred someone to Cynthia to help as a consultant in midwifery. I don't think the name of Ginger Breedlove. This person is in the Midwest and she and her husband have a company. Um, that, I think that's Ginger. That Ginger, that Ginger? has a lawyer. Um, yes. They own okay. a consulting company. Yes. Mm -hmm. I talked to her one time on the phone on a Zoom, on a similar call. I don't think it was a Zoom call, just a call where she was helping C uh, Cynthia. But yes. She's a great resource. Highly recommend. Yeah. And I think there are, there is opportunity for retired physicians such as yourself to counsel new physicians in this integrative model of bringing midwives on. So, I mean, we, we can't cheer for you enough because... Um, the more that physicians like yourself willing to break with the party line 
and break with the old methods of excluding for profit and instead centering people, the closer we're going to get to this new reality we want to see of integrative medicine. So like we need people like you desperately. Well, wh whoever is desperately needs me, I'm, I'm open. And my wife <laughs> is certainly open to me having something else to do other than driving her crazy. Uh, awesome. I, you know, I miss seeing the people that I took care of. Now, obviously in these last years, it was people I delivered, their children who I delivered. So there was a connection there, but it was different. Although I was managing the practice for a while, I was still to a large degree out of the loop of the midwifery part of the practice. You know, yeah. I, I couldn't drive the bus, so to speak. That's yeah. It. That's as politely as I can say it. You can't can't drive the bus. So I would probably be much, much less frustrated in a consulting role when I'm really yeah. not driving the bus. Just because... share your wisdom. It's a great way to live. <laughs> we have a yeah. we have a consultancy program here at Midwifery Wisdom as well, but all of our consultancy is focused on community based space, not hospital space. Whereas Ginger is pretty much uh, very focused on integrating nurse midwives into hospital systems yes yes and, and i think yeah. there's a place for both so you your role would be in in the birth center approach uh, out of hospital correct yeah we help open and scale birth centers and private practices for home births yeah and and uh, i will at some point we'll see i think that cynthia has to crawl a little bit a lot before she walks and i think she has mentioned to me about a birth center. And I said, well, I thought to myself, well, you, you know, you got to, <laughs> I want to say you do it this way and see how well you treat people first. I didn't say it quite that way, but I, I think, yeah. I think uh, she needs to do that first, but it's always looking at the agenda of the, and I'm sure that's what you have to do. And that's what Ginger uh, has to do is what is the real agenda on the part of the physician who's motivated to do this? Do they really have a passion for it or is it just a, include a moneymaker? Yeah. Or sometimes even it's ego because when you are the one physician that lots of midwives can practice under, there's a lot of adoration and that creates a weird dynamic too. That's pretty sick. You know? <laughs> there, is, there's, there's weird power dynamics that exist in yeah. this physician yeah. midwife reality. And it is the, like, I've been talking for years about uniting the silos and building this bridge between these two um, seemingly collegial professions, but who have been literally at their throats since physicians began a hundred plus years ago, taking over the birth space. And um, I'm almost excited about the state of the affairs. Obviously, it's horrible how we got here and it's horrible how many people are suffering and literally dying because of the American health yes. model. But the reality is, is we've gotten to this place where like, we must integrate, we must add these other services, yes. we must find another way, we can't allow people to die any longer, we can't allow people to be marginalized and delegitimized and, and ignored any longer, the statistics are clear, midwives save lives. Oh, absolutely. So there is there better outcomes. Yeah, there's two points that it, from what you just said that I wanted to bring up. One is the opportunity that and in collaborative practice that we yeah. have because it's not just about the birth it's no. them making other healthy choices perhaps because of the birth and where the collaborative practice can incorporate the exercise physiologist the nutritionist for healthy living all aspects of their life not just in 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 the birth and well, and in. midwives do that so well because, of course, midwifery is focused on holistic health care instead of the care of the uterus, right? Which is such a different perspective. Yes. So yes. they we need, need to have midwives. time to do it, though. You know, they, and sometimes. And that gets insurance and the, oh, it's, there's so many levels to this, isn't it? R right, right. Insurance can be a, yeah, that's a problem with if you try to, I can see the physical therapist for pelvic floor therapy uh, and the clinical psychologist for a lot of the psychological issues, the families aren't perfect and they're coming in with some baggage and, and no. you may want to do it. You may not be trained well enough to take them to that next level. So 
if you can incorporate a few of those people into the group. Oh, we'd love well. that. Unfortunately, insurance oftentimes will require oh, yeah. authorization. Oh, yeah, because then it's fee splitting. Yeah, you're making yeah, a referral to someone. Yeah, that's her. Well, we could get lost in insurance, but let's instead tell people about your where they can get your book, when it's coming out, how they can follow you online. The website is DarylMartinBooks.com. Got it. We'll put that in the show notes. And the launch date is July 16th. Congratulations. It, yeah, thank you. And it'll be available on Amazon and Kindle and uh, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, all after the launch date. We'll probably, we're going to do something in Nashville that next week, but the books are going out to reviewers the end of this oh. week, the first next week, and then we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, I, I'm, I still have, you know, whether it's a dream or just a daydream of the movie can, can reach a lot of people who then back in into the book. And I think it's a worthy story as I see a lot of the stuff that is less than desirable out on, on the movie world. Some of the, the true stories are the most, to me, the most impactful when you see them on, on the screen. Um, Indeed. Well, yeah. we will pray that that gets picked up because more stories of midwives and all of the their champions like yourself need to be celebrated. Daryl, thank you so much for coming on, thank sharing you. your heart, your stories, and your book. We will definitely be sharing that when it launches. And thank you so much. Thank you. Did you you have the name of the book, right? Probably. In good hands. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's a longer thing after that about birthright and midwifery, but basically in good hands. And it's the hands of that delivery that are on the cover. You'll see the so, cover if you look, if you look at the um, if you look at that the website. The, the cover picture is on there. Okay, we'll share that too. Okay. Thank you, so thank, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Take care. Okay. Have a great day.